As I previously discussed, the law of the few says that one critical factor in epidemics is the nature of the messenger. A pair of shoes or a warning or an infection or a new movie can become highly contagious and tip simply by being associated with a particular kind of person. But in all those examples, I took it as a given that the message itself was something that could be passed on. Paul Revere started a word-of-mouth epidemic with the phrase, the British are coming. If he had instead gone on that midnight ride to tell people he was having a sale on the pewter mugs at his silversmith shop, even he, with all his enormous personal gifts, could not have galvanized the Massachusetts countryside. In epidemics, the messenger matters. Messengers are what make something spread. But the content of the message matters, too. And the specific quality that a message needs to be successful is the quality of stickiness. Is the message or the food or the movie or the product memorable? Is it so memorable, in fact, that it can create change, that it can spur someone to action? Stickiness sounds like it should be straightforward. When most of us want to make sure what we say is remembered, we speak with emphasis. We talk loudly and we repeat what we have to say over and over again. Marketers feel the same way. There's a maxim in the advertising business that an advertisement has to be seen at least six times before anyone will remember it. That's a useful message for Coca-Cola or Nike, who have hundreds of millions of dollars to spend on marketing and can afford to saturate all forms of media with their message. But it's not all that useful for, say, a group of people trying to spark a literacy epidemic with a small budget and one hour of programming on public television. Are there smaller, subtler, easier ways to make something stick? The answer is that there are, although they lie in areas where we may not expect them to be. If you look closely at epidemic ideas or messages, as often as not, the elements that make them sticky turn out to be small and seemingly trivial. Consider, for example, the so-called fear experiment conducted by the social psychologist Howard Leventhal in the 1960s. Leventhal wanted to see if he could convince a group of college seniors at Yale University to get a tetanus shot. He divided them up into several groups and gave all of them a seven-page booklet explaining the dangers of tetanus, the importance of inoculation, and the fact that the university was offering free tetanus shots at the campus health center to all interested students. The booklets, however, came in several versions. Some of the students were given a high-fear version, which described tetanus in dramatic terms and included color photographs of a child having a tetanus seizure and other tetanus victims with urinary catheters, tracheotomy wounds, and nasal tubes. In the low-fear version, the language describing the risks of tetanus was toned down and the photographs were omitted. Leventhal wanted to see what impact the different booklets had on the students' attitudes towards tetanus and their likelihood of getting a shot. The results were, in part, quite predictable. When they were given a questionnaire later, all of the students appeared to be well-educated about the dangers of tetanus. But those who were given the High Fear booklet were more convinced of the dangers of tetanus, more convinced of the importance of shots, and were more likely to say that they intended to get inoculated. All of those differences evaporated, however, when Leventhal looked at how many of the students actually went and got a shot. One month after the experiments, almost none of the subjects, a mere 3%, had actually gone to the health clinic to get inoculated. For some reason, the students had forgotten everything they had learned about tetanus, and the lessons they had been told weren't translating into action. The experiment didn't stick. Why not? If we didn't know about the stickiness factor we probably would have concluded that something was wrong with the way the booklet explained tetanus to the students. We might have wondered whether trying to scare them was the appropriate direction to take, or whether there is a social stigma that surrounds tetanus that inhibits students from admitting that they are at risk, or perhaps that medical care itself is intimidating to students. In any case, that only 3% of students responded would suggest that we were a long way from reaching our goal. But the stickiness factor suggests something quite different. It suggests the problem probably isn't with the overall conception of the message at all, and that maybe all the campaign needs is a new approach. Sure enough, when Leventhal redid the experiment, one small change was sufficient to tip the vaccination rate up to 28%. It was simply including a map of the campus, with the University Health Building circled, and the times that shots were available clearly listed, along with a booklet.
There are two interesting implications to this study. The first is that of the 28% who got inoculated, an equal number were from the high fear as low fear group. Whatever extra persuasive muscle was found in the high fear booklet was clearly irrelevant. The students knew, without seeing gory pictures, what the dangers of tetanus were and what they ought to be doing. The second interesting thing is that, of course, as seniors, they must have already known where the health center was and doubtless had visited it several times already. It is doubtful that any of them would ever actually have used the map. In other words, what the tetanus intervention needed in order to tip was not an avalanche of new or additional information. What it needed was a subtle but significant change in presentation. The students needed to know how to fit the tetanus stuff into their lives. The addition of the map and the times when the shots were available shifted the booklet from an abstract lesson in medical risk, a lesson no different from the countless other academic lessons they had received over their academic career, to a practical and personal piece of medical advice. And once the advice became practical and personal, it became memorable. There are enormous implications in Leventhal's fear experiments for the question of how to start and tip social epidemics. We have become, in our society, overwhelmed by people clamoring for our attention. In just the past decade, the time devoted to advertisements in a typical hour of network television has grown from six minutes to nine minutes. The New York-based firm Media Dynamics estimates that the average American is now exposed to 254 different commercial messages in a day. There are now millions of websites on the Internet. Cable systems routinely carry over 50 channels of programming. And a glance inside the magazine section of any Barnes & Noble will tell you that there are thousands of magazines coming out each week and month, chock full of advertising and information. In the advertising business, this surfeit of information is called the clutter problem. And clutter has made it harder and harder to get any one message to stick. Much of what we are told or read or watch, we simply don't remember. The information age has created a stickiness problem. But Leventhal's example suggests that there may be simple ways to enhance stickiness and systematically engineer stickiness into a message. This is a fact of obvious importance to marketers, teachers, and managers. Perhaps no one has done more to illustrate the potential of this kind of stickiness engineering, however, than children's educational television, in particular, the creators of Sesame Street.